In yesterday's episode, we explored the Corvega assembly plant in Lexington. The Corvega is the brand name of one of many cars made by the Chrysler Company. We find the Chrysler Building in the Capital Wasteland. To find it, we travel to the Farragut West Metro Station. And from here, we find a big destroyed overpass and take the road northeast. Pretty soon, we see the building loom to the right. We pass by a line of parked cars, likely an employee parking lot, to find the front door to the Chrysler Building. Above the door, we see a big advertisement for what must have been one of the latest vehicles available from Chrysler. The Corvega Atomic V8, driving paradise. It's a beauty. We see the Atomic V8 on display just outside. It is distinguished from the sedans in that it only has two doors. Also, let's welcome back Sharon. It was fun running with Jericho, but he just has such a filthy mouth. Hard to please YouTube's advertiser-friendly gods with Jericho as a companion. And so, I brought back good old Sharon. I took him out of that outcast set of T-45 and instead put him in my spare suit of T-51. Like Jericho, poor old Sharon is having hair problems, though not due to old age, but mainly due to rotting flesh. So I went ahead and gave him Button Gwinnett's white powdered wig. And then I gave him some snazzy hipster glasses. He's looking quite dapper. Since the condition of gear does not degrade when used by companions in Fallout 3, I went ahead and fully repaired his T-51 suit to offer him maximum protection. I also went ahead and got dog meat back. He's been missing for a while, so this should prove to be a fun adventure. Before going inside, we can explore the perimeter. Going around the building, we see activity off to the north. Kinda looks like a baseball diamond. Here we see two raiders. After killing them and looting their corpses, we find a baseball bat on one and a bunch of frag grenades on the other. Looks like this guy was a pitcher throwing frag grenades at the batter. Talk about tempting fate. We find a bus stop out here for employees who chose to take the bus to work. It's a short walk away from the office, and it looks like many of the employees drove the very cars their company created. Here's an example of the four-door sedan version of the Corvega. These make an appearance even in Fallout 4, and right next to it, another example of the Atomic V8. If you're interested, I did a completely separate video dedicated to the vehicles of the Fallout universe. You can watch that video by clicking here. When we're ready, we can head to the southern side of the building and head through the front door. As soon as we enter, we see a super mutant overlord patrolling a second floor level. And then a master snuck by. I didn't kill that overlord, but he disappeared. I'm not sure where he went. We find ourselves in a foyer, and there's a large reception desk in the front. We find 5.56mm five, five, magazines in a box behind the counter, and sadly all the terminals are wrecked so we can't read them. Looking up, the second floor has completely crumbled into this lobby level. We see red lines on our Pip-Boy compass. There are more super mutants on the second level, and from down here we are sitting ducks. We find a four-door Corvega sedan on display in the very middle of the reception area, but it's pretty destroyed, with the second floor having collapsed on it and everything. At length, the super mutant overlord we attacked earlier heads back into this main chamber. these overlords. But then a master appears. Hey. I thought that about cleared it, so I turned on my light to explore this floor, but no, there are more lurking around here somewhere. I hopped up on the sedan in the middle of the floor to look around, and I wasn't paying attention. Dogmeat and Sharon ran off and got themselves in trouble. Hey. But I didn't know from where. And when a companion dies in Fallout 3, it's permanent. 
I didn't want Sharon or Dogmeat to die. Heading west, we find a door, but it's locked with a very hard lock. I was hoping this would lead to a hallway where I could rescue Sharon, but after picking it, I found a door to the Christless basement, a completely different zone. But then I had an idea. If I zone in, the game will teleport Sharon to my location, and in so doing, I'll have a chance to save him. So zoning in, we attract the attention of another overlord down some steps. After he's dead, we can wait a little bit to see if any of those other super mutants from upstairs wanted to follow us down, but I got lucky and none of them did. I wasn't quite ready to explore this basement yet, so turning around, we can head back up the steps to the Christless reception area. Once we're back in the lobby, we can loot the various containers we find here, and then we get attacked by a centaur. I think this guy may have followed us up from the basement. Shortly thereafter, we get attacked by one of the super mutant brutes Sharon had found earlier. He's had enough. And with that, I think we've finally cleared this first floor. Though it's hard to know all these side passages. To start exploring, we'll go down the southeasternmost passage first. The hallway turns west. We can loot a Nuka Kula machine in a little lounge nook. And continuing down, we find another hallway heading off to the north. This leads back to the main foyer. So turning back around, we can continue west and then turn left into the first room. As we begin to explore, we hear super mutants making noises off deeper in the building. I want to clear these guys so they don't kill one of my companions later on. So going down the hallway and turning north... Hey. Where? Where? Bring it. Got him. All right, heading back into that room, we can try to finish exploring. There are plenty of containers here. Great opportunity to make use of the scrounger perk. After looting every container in this place, I walked away with over 2,000 caps. In the eastern part of this room, we find a hole in the wall, leading to another room completely caved in. Here we find a little corner office. There's an ammunition box with missiles inside, a wooden box underneath with a Nuka-Cola Quantum inside, and more caps in the desk. Heading out and turning right, we find some shotgun shells in a box, and that's it for this room. Heading out and back down the hallway, we see the corpses we killed a moment ago. The next opening is directly to the left, leading to another big destroyed room. There's a hole in the wall leading to another room to the north. We'll start by exploring the perimeter of this one. We find Jet on an office desk next to a terminal, and more 5.56mm magazines in a stew pot on a desk in the southwestern corner. Heading through the hole in the wall, man, we see so many shelves filled with scrap. We can start start by going to the northwest. Here we find a first aid box on the wall, turning around to the bookshelf to the east. Nothing under the traffic cone, but there are two vials of Radex underneath a ruined book. There's a first aid box on the shelf opposite this one, and here we can loot the corpse of one of the mutants we killed. This room connects to another room through yet another big hole in the wall, but we don't find anything of note here. So heading back to the hallway, we can turn around to see what we missed. We find a little computer nook. Here we can loot the two super mutants we killed earlier, and we see some stairs to the second level. Let's put a pin in this, make a mental note to come back later. I want to finish exploring this first floor first. Continuing north, we can round the corner. Heading east, we find a hard-locked door to the left. There's a wall-mounted terminal outside, and it's only got an average lock on it. After hacking the terminal and opening the door, we see a hole in the ceiling leading to the second floor. Okay, gonna have to be careful here. Don't want to get shot at from above. The smoke is thick in this room, rising from the ground up through the hole in the ceiling. In the middle of this room, we find a small table upon which is a 44 Magnum revolver, a copy of Guns and Bullets magazine, and two ammunition boxes, one on the table and one underneath it. In a stoop pot on the shelf to the southeast, we find a box of shotgun shells. And turning to the northwest, in a box on a table by a window, we find a bottle of buff out hiding between two hammers. After looting a Nuka-Cola machine, we see a stairway in the middle of the western wall leading down. This must connect to the basement that we briefly entered from the foyer. Gonna have to put a pin in this and make a mental note for later. Heading out to the hallway and turning right, we find a path that leads back to the foyer. Okay, 
Connecting dots here, that's good. Heading back in and going east down the hallway, we pass by a big wrecked room to the right, and we can go through a doorway to the left. Here we find a bear trap on the ground. Goodness, that looks nasty. But aside from that, there's nothing of note in this room. Continuing to the east, we round the hallway to the south, and that completes the loop, bringing us back out to the foyer. All right, we've explored everything on this first floor. We now need to head up to the second. So heading back to the south, we can turn west down the hallway and then scale that staircase we found to the second floor. Looting the mutant corpses along our way, we find a ruined room spilling its rubble into the hallway at the top of the stairs. So going through a doorway to the main hallway, we see a shelf to the left and bathrooms to the right. Going right first, we can loot some Nuka-Cola from some Nuka-Cola machines, some filing cabinets to the north, which is a dead end, and then explore a ladies' restroom. Opening the first stall door, we disturb a garden gnome sitting on the toilet in the next. But wait, what's this? Oh, looks like there were two of these set up on the toilets doing some sort of protest. Let's see, what do these signs say? One says, we're dying, jerks. And the other one's, well, let's see, we gotta move this gnome first. The other one says, help us. We've seen this before, back at Vault 101. I know, when we were fleeing Vault 101, we were moving in quite a hurry. It's possible we missed it. But right outside the big vault door to Vault 101, our former home, we find human skeletons lying on the grating holding signs. These signs say, Let us in, you nasty people. Help us! With a big bloody handprint and... We're dying, jerks! The very same signs we see being held by the gnomes in the Christless bathroom. How do we explain this? Well, perhaps these are not hand-painted signs. Perhaps there was some sort of pre-war inside joke where a company had made a bunch of protest signs like these and put them up for sale. It's really the only way I can explain why we find identical protest signs in two different places. The ones outside Vault 101, of course, make sense. Those people wanted in the vault after the bombs dropped. But the ones here in the bathroom do not make sense. With that, we finish exploring the bathroom. Heading south, we can examine that shelf we saw. There's nothing in this pot, but we find pre-war money in the box. Heading south, we can go one of two ways. We can turn east or go south. Let's go south first. This brings us into a grimy decaying room, but it's pretty large. We find Mentats on a bookshelf to the southwest. A box with pre-war money and dirty water on a shelf to the northeast. A cabinet to the southwest guarded with an already triggered bear trap. Inside the cabinet is a sawn-off shotgun and shotgun shells. And then we find a wall-mounted first aid kit to the southeast. Continuing through a hole in this wall to the next room over, all we find here is a piece of Psycho hiding beneath an overturned stew pot. Heading out the door to the north brings us back to the hallway. We can turn west to see what we missed while we were in this room, and we just missed a little drinking fountain corner with nothing of interest in these boxes. So turning around to go east, we can follow the hallway until it turns a corner to the north. And here we arrive in that large office cubicle room that had caved in to the foyer below. Oh man, where to begin? <laughs> This room is kind of intimidating. We'll start by going clockwise around the perimeter. We can loot one of the super mutant masters we killed inside a wooden box. At the bottom of a nearby shelf, we find one piece of Radex. Continuing north and then turning east, we can loot the next super mutant overlord and then head east until we see a door to the north. Heading into this door, we see that it follows a hallway to the west. There's a big smattering of blood on the ground and ah, there it is, a tripwire connected to a swinging girder trap. The blood on the ground tells us that these super mutants have caught someone by this trap in the past. After disarming the trap and moving north through the door, we find ourselves in the room atop the room with the Nuka-Cola machine we explored below. Looks like this was some sort of computer room. We found a big stack of ruined computers in a corner, but all we find here are more containers that make use of the scrounger perk. So turning around and heading back out to the floor above the foyer, we can continue exploring to the east. On a shelf to the north, we can finally turn off that radio that's been blurring ever since we entered. 
third. And then turning south, we see another bookshelf to the east, which is hiding a Mintats next to a tin can. Continuing along, we find a box of 308 caliber rounds hiding behind a filing cabinet, some jet hiding behind a mug on a shelf to the northeast. And with that, we complete exploring the top level. This leaves only the basement left to go. So retracing our steps, we can go through that door that was locked with a hard lock, where we found that staircase next to the Nuka-Cola machine, leading down to the west. This brings us to a door leading to the Chrysler's building lower offices. We arrive on the other side in some sort of storage room. Turning southwest, we can loot an ammunition box on a metal shelf, and some right away dirty water and pre-war money in a box on the shelf to the southeast. Turning around, we see a big shelf covered in tires, here we find a frag mine and a first aid box, and we see another bear trap on the ground in front of a bookshelf to the east. We can disarm this for the experience. The shelf opens up to a hallway to the east. We see spatters of blood on the ground and one very big puddle in front of this very hard locked door. Oh man, these very hard locked doors require a lockpick skill of 100 to pick. By now I have that, but even at max lockpicking skill, these can take quite some time to pick. But after a lengthy battle, I finally got it open. Inside, we find Brahmin corpses on the ground. Oh my. Well, I suppose this shouldn't be unexpected. After all, this place is swarming with super mutants. And as we learned from exploring the town of Novak in Fallout New Vegas, super mutants sure do love their Brahmin. Heading out and going east, both Sharon and Dogmeat started to get all agitated. We hear growling coming out of a door to the north, but this door is also locked with a very hard lock. After spending way too much time picking this sucker, we finally open it to see vicious dogs! Damn it! Man! Inside this room turning left, we see a stack of pre-war money in a box on top of a desk. Then underneath it, we find another box, this one with Jet and Psycho inside. Going through a hole in this room to the east leads us to another room with just a big stack of filing cabinets in the middle. Nothing else of interest. There's a door leading back out to the hallway here, but this is also locked with a very hard lock. Yeah, I'm not going to waste my time on this. Turning back around and going through the door we already picked back to the hallway, we find a door across the way also locked with a very hard lock. What the heck, Bethesda? Oh, man. Ooh, we find ourselves in a bloody room. Creeping forward, we see another very hard locked door, but before we can pick it, we inadvertently alert a mutant to our presence. Racing out around the corner, an overlord... <laughs> Oh, got him. And on his body is the Chrysler's building master key. Ah, oh, I should have killed this guy first instead of wasting my time picking those very hard locked locks. Sure enough, going back into the big bloody room, we can use this key to unlock the wrecked door. Inside, we find the entrance to a larger room. There's blood all over the floor and a human skeleton in a shopping cart cage. We can loot a first aid box on the wall and we see what appears to be a butchery table. We find strange meat on skewers. I'm sure that strange is probably in quotes. A gore bag on the ground and then big slabs of dog meat. Oh, this is just disgusting. Can you imagine what it must smell like? These gore bags are particularly rich sources of ammunition and caps. But uh-oh, Sharon has picked up a scent. Uh, but following him, we don't see anyone. We're still hidden. Oh! A centaur in this lower room. We see a lot of these covered in blood. These must be pens. Sharon marches through a doorway to the south. Thought I... Where? There's more where that came from. Game's over! What's the matter, huh? Can't stand the sight of your own blood? And hopefully that's the last of them. You know, we just kind of walked through a huge sprawling maze. 
I'm a little bit turned around. So just to get our bearings, we're going to retrace our steps back to the hallway we used to enter this large room. Now we have a point of reference from which to explore. We find these desks covered in more skewers of strange meat, puddles of blood and bloody handprints. On this desk, we find a vial of buff out. Peering down into this little cage, we see human skeletons. Looks like the mutants have been here trapping and consuming people for quite some time. We find a radio hiding behind a cubicle on a desk to the northwest, which we can turn off. And then we see a coffee room to the northwest. Lots of suitcases and desks here. A bunch of boxes on the counter. And in one, we find a copy of Pugilism Illustrated. After looting a Nuka-Cola machine, we spend much of the rest of our time looting the myriad of desks and gore bags in this room. It connects to another room through a hole in the wall to the west. On the other side of this wall is a metal shelf, upon which we find some buff out and jet. Heading to the southwest, we find another cubicle. We find an ammo box hiding behind the desk. On a desk in the middle of this room, we find a piece of Psycho next to more strange meat. And on a desk to the north against the wall, we find a piece of jet, next to a shelf upon which we find more buff out. Near to this is a gun case with 44 magnum ammunition and a lever action rifle. And then on a bookshelf to the southwest, we find two boxes of 10 millimeter rounds. Here we find a doorway in the wall to the south leading to a room where we killed those mutants a moment ago. After looting the bodies in containers, we can pass into the adjacent room through a hole in the wall to loot some buff out that we find in a wooden box filled with beer on a bookshelf to the northwest. There's a box of sugar bombs on a desk to the northeast, which we can give to Murphy. And when done exploring this room, we can turn south, where we find a staircase leading downstairs. At the bottom, we can turn north down a hallway. We see a room to the right. Oh! Oh, and I completely missed that tripwire. It was connected to a combat shotgun trap at the end of the wall. Well, thankfully, I was fully armored. Inside, we find an ammunition box serving as bait on the floor, and another one locked with an easy lock on a shelf to the northeast. Heading out and turning north, we find ourselves in another large hallway, and we see offices lining the hallway. Entering the one to the east, we realize that we are inside the super mutant pens. This is where they would keep human prisoners until they were ready for consumption. We find gore bags and blood all over the place. Heading out and turning north, we find another pen to the northeast. We find a variety of human skeletons and bones all over the ground. Heading back out, this must have been a pre-war break room. We find an Etotronic on the wall with some sugar bombs inside. Vault Tech and American propaganda posters on the wall behind. A refrigerator and a Nuka-Cola machine against the wall to the northeast. And then heading west, we see that the hallway goes south or we can turn north. Turning north first, we see a door against the northern wall. This leads to the Chrysler's building basement. Oh man, so there's another level? We'll tackle that in a minute. Instead, turning east, we can loot a first aid kit on a wall to the south, and we find a 44 Magnum in a cabinet next to it. Rounding the corner, we find the door to a private office, which is now one of the most horrifying sights in the building. Human skeletons all over the floor, and bloody handprints leading up the wall. Looks like some of these people got close to climbing out before they were inevitably killed. But this is a dead end, so heading out and turning south, we can go west and into another cage where we find more hanging gore bags. And next to this is the final room where we killed that centaur from above. This is another awfully bloody one. Centaur pieces, human pieces, skeletons, handprints, blood spatter, gore bags. There's even a skeleton hanging from a floor here. Looks like he almost got out. The final room is in the far southwestern corner. We see a huge puddle of blood right in front of the door. More spatter on the ground. And on a table, we find a stealth boy. Could this be an early hint towards what we learned in Fallout New Vegas about how super mutants are addicted to stealth boys? Although these DC super mutants are an entirely different breed, still, maybe there's something there. With that, we fully explore the pens, and we can then take the northern door down to the building basement. 
On the other side, we immediately get detected by mutants. Time to die! Die, Metal Man! Need some help with this one. I zoned in on the Overlord whom I knew my companions would have a hard time with, let them deal with the weaker ones, and took this guy down. That takes care of that. Sharon and Dogmeat cleaned up pretty well, and they're still alive. Ah, oh, good. Okay. Well... Talk about a welcoming commission, and they didn't even bring cake. Let's see, where to begin? Well, turning south and rounding the corner, we find another room to the south. Here we find one more centaur. Good enough. And many more ruined cubicles, filing cabinets, and desks to loot. Of note, we find some Radaway right and Subway tokens on a desk to the southwest. Directly southeast of here, we find a bookshelf filled with two frag grenades, Radex and Radaway. Turning to the northeast, we find a jar of buff out in a wooden box on a shelf. And that's about it in this room, and this room is a dead end. So turning around, we can go back down the hallway, past all of the carnage, and we find two rooms to turn into. Turning into the eastern room, and we don't find much. We find pool balls hiding in a stew pot on the bottom of a shelf. And just more containers to loot, so heading out and turning north down the hallway first, we find a Nuka Cola machine by a water fountain. And then turning back down the hallway, there's a box of shotgun shells near to another stew pot, and then a dead end. This is where we killed that overlord. So, looks like the way forward is to go back down the hallway and through the western door. We find a box of 308 caliber rounds in a stew pot on a bookshelf to the northwest, and it looks like these rounds are way too big for the stew pot. And moving through a hole in the wall to the southwestern room, oh, it's a slaughterhouse. Looks like the mutants were keeping fresh corpses here to await processing. We find Wastelander corpses, a few that have been reduced to skeletons, three dead Brahmin, and one dead raider. These people must have been killed right here, for their bloody handprints are on the wall. Out of the slaughterhouse through the northern door, we come to a new hallway. There's a door at the western end, and the eastern end is blocked. So moving west, we see an open door to the north and a closed door to the west. Peeking through the open door, we are about to go forward when we hear a noise coming from the room to the west. After looting a first aid box on the wall by the door, we turn around to see that we are in some sort of unfinished brick basement. We find a big book of science on a metal rack to the west, and a sawed-off shotgun in a gun cabinet to the southwest. But that's it for this unfinished basement. So heading out and into the northeastern door, we see blood dripping from an oven, but inside all we find is a Brahmin steak. That's one rare steak. There's a first aid box in a refrigerator, a few more gore bags to loot, and one Nuka Cola machine. We see stairs going up, but before climbing the stairs, we can go through a hole in the eastern wall to explore this final room. In a northeastern nook, we find a floor safe on top of which is another stealth boy. More evidence, perhaps, of these super mutants growing stealth boy addiction. The safe is locked with an easy lock, and inside we find a small selection of ammunition. One of the wooden boxes on the shelf has a rat away, and the other is hiding a bottle of whiskey. To the southeast, we find a wall-mounted safe and a wall terminal. Both are locked with easy locks. The safe has no lore on it. We just use it to unlock the wall-mounted safe within which we find a small stash of caps. That's it for this final room, so heading out, we can go up the steps, which leads us back to the Chrysler's reception area. And with that, we fully explore the DC headquarters of the Chrysler Corporation, the makers of the best nuclear-powered cars in the Fallout universe, the Corvega. Now, Chrysler has another presence here in the Capital Wasteland. Here we also find a Corvega factory. We'll round off our exploration of Chrysler's activities on the East Coast when we explore the factory in another video. What are your thoughts on Chrysler? 
Did you make it this way in your playthrough of Fallout 3? Are you as fond as I am of the beautiful car designs we find in the Fallout universe? I love the look in Fallout 3 and New Vegas, but you know what? I think I have fallen in love with the rounded edges and beautiful shapes of the versions we find in Fallout 4. Share your thoughts with me in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. If you want to make sure you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a new shirt in the shop, folks. Do you have a Geiger counter? This is a revision of an old shirt I used to have in the shop. I think this one is much more interesting. It comes in a wide array of colors and in a variety of sizes. You can find it on shirts and a whole bunch of other goodies. I have many, many more designs in the shop, and if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do, and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.